Okay. Thank you all for joining us for our career panel on logistics and supply chain management here at North Carolina Wesleyan. We have a wonderful set of panelists here to talk with students and a few alums that are joining us as well this evening about the field as well as Wesleyan's major in logistics and supply chain management, which was started in 2019. Uh, so we're so excited about this opportunity and look forward to talking with you. Just a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, if you do have questions, do feel free to post those in the chat and I will be moderating that as best as I can. And there might be an opportunity to vocalize questions at some point as well. We'll see what kind of time we have uh, for that, but feel free to, to type in your questions as we go. Um, and please stay muted otherwise in the background. And again, we are recording. Uh, if you do want to join us on camera, we'd love to see you. And if not, we understand that as well. So first off, I want to introduce myself. I'm Jesse Langley. I'm the Associate Dean of Career Development and Leadership at Wesleyan. I enjoy working with students on helping them make their career decisions, career plans, and then how to pursue those and do their personal marketing towards those plans. Uh, been with Wesleyan for 13 years and worked with some students like one of our panelists here. I'll let him reveal himself uh, <laughs> later. Uh, but I enjoy working with many of you on the call and glad to see you've joined us. Um, Melanie, if you would introduce yourself next. Yeah, sure. I'm Melanie Townsend, and I am the program coordinator for the uh, logistics program here at Wesleyan. This is my second year at Wesleyan. Um, I actually began my career in human resources um, and kind of saw that most of the decisions were happening on the operations side. So that's where I made that shift very early on in my career. Uh, I got my undergraduate degree in organizational development um, from Bethel College in Tennessee, which is where I'm from, and my master's degree in operations management from the University of Arkansas, because that's when I had made that shift. Um, and so I've worked uh, primarily in um, logistics, not as much in supply chain, but mostly third party logistics. So I'm really excited to talk to you guys about the program and answer any questions that you have. Great. Thank you, Dr. Townsend. Mr. Scarborough, would you go next? Hey, I'm Sheldon Scarborough and I work for UPS. Um, I'm an account executive for the company. And one of the things that I do most um, is move packages. Um, the things that really helped me get to where I am today is I spent a lot of time in operations, finance, and then sales before I kind of transitioned into the logistical role. Thank you. All right, Mr. Sufatelli. Yep, so Ricardo Sufatelli or Ricky Sufatelli, like many of you know me. Um, I guess I'm the one who worked directly with Jesse. Uh, when I was a student, I graduated in 2015. Um, currently work as the supply chain manager at Maine Pharma. Um, I oversee all the planning activities for Maine and manage the relationship with our suppliers. So um, luckily for me, I was able to always work in supply chain after, you know, when I enter the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry. So um, don't have, you know, a background in operations or different other departments, but, you know, always have been uh, within the supply chain area. Thank you, Ricky. And Tracy, if you would mind uh, introducing yourself, Ms. Walker. Ms. Walker, we're not quite hearing you. It looks like you're muted. Trying to, there we go. There we I go. Think I'm muted now. Uh, apologies. Good. So um, I'm Tracy Walker. Um, I uh, I graduated from Wesleyan in 2000, 2006 when I was um, already an adult. I went through the adult program when my children were small. I had my associate's degree in systems technology. Um, supply chain kind of found me. I uh, started out after I got my associate's degree after a couple of years as a, in a temp job and was like, oh, okay, you know, there, there wasn't a... There wasn't a supply chain degree <laughs> back, back in those days. So I start, I, um, like Ricky said, I've always been in supply chain. I've, um, I've done a little bit of everything. I started out in production planning and scheduling. 
moved into master scheduling, um, SNOP, uh, moved into um, planning management for um, the production planning and purchase part planning. Um, then I started out in automotive, uh, which is just in time, which is something I know your students are gonna learn a lot about. Um, they're, uh, the real world just in time is a lot different than the book, than the book, the book part just in time. I will tell you that it's a very exciting um, and, and very busy place to be if you're in that type of environment. Um, I moved from there to uh, Revlon um, in Oxford. They're the only Revlon manufacturer in the world. There's a lot of other Revlons, but they're the only one that manufactures. And from there, I took on more um, process roles and working with the supply base and supply improvement and crisis management. And then from there, I... Um, became the key user for implementation of SAP, um, which I'm sure your students will hear a lot about as well, because I know that uh, SAP is, um, is, is very popular in, in the last several years. Um, and then uh, when launch was complete, I moved uh, closer to home, um, eight miles down the road. I'm the supply chain manager at US Food Cure Tobacco. So under, under my hat is production planning, um, purchasing logistics, warehouse inventory. So um, kind of done a little bit of everything, kind of the end to end supply chain. Um, I have probably have less um, logistics um, like Shelton would, would know more about. Um, so I'm sure I can learn some things there. That would probably be the, the least amount of my experience. But again, like Ricky, always, always been in supply chain. Um, I, it just, it found me, I eat, sleep, breathe it. It's, there's, there's nothing else I want to do. Wonderful. Thank you all to our uh, panelists for spending the time with us tonight and for your introductions and sharing with us uh, as we move through our questions. So first off, Tracy, I think you set it up well. You mentioned uh, Mr. Scarborough might have the uh, details for us for this next question. So would you, Sheldon, please share, how would you describe what is logistics? Well, logistics is an overall process and it um, contains three elements. I don't care what business you're in. And the elements are how do we acquire the product or the resources? How do we store it? And then how do we move it or transport it to the end user? That's how I describe logistics. You have to manage those three items to be effective and help you position your customer or your employer in, in, a, in a way that you are competitive that is sustainable to the industry. Great, great, thank you. And to compare that or, or complement that, I guess with the other half of our academic program on supply chain management, um, which of our panelists would like to describe that area and how that differs? Well, I mean, I guess um, it's pretty similar uh, again, these, these processes that take place on the back end, but a little different than logistics. It involves also not only the purchasing of the material, but you're purchasing raw materials, manufacturing, packaging in some instances. Um, you got to have the quality controls in place, the um, end product, then moving the product to the warehouse to then be enter into the logistics channel where it's transported to the customers or the end user who, who eventually receives the product. So uh, similar to that, but it just involves a few more processes that, that may involve the manufacturing, packaging, quality controls, and um, I guess other processes in the manufacturing uh, area. Great. Okay. That's a good, good way to describe. Uh, I also think of it as we're, everyone is kind of our customer. So you have, you have an end customer, but you, you also have internal customers. So if you're, you know, if you're on the purchasing side and the, you know, production planning side, then of course production is, production is your, is your customer. Quality is your customer when you're launching something new or if you have an issue, um, usually you're, you're the one who's gonna get that call. So you're, to me, you're, you're kind of central to, to all of the other um, 
departments and uh, all of the other things that go into getting the product out the door. Um, uh, that that's how I kind of see, like I said, it's kind of where every, everyone's your, everyone is your customer. And uh, sometimes that's, uh, I look at it that way because you're, ultimately I've got to make my, my end customer happy, but I can't make my end customer happy unless I have my raw materials to, to make the uh, production happy, to be able to make the product, to be able to make logistics happy to to get the product to ship out the door right right yeah it sounds like a, a giant puzzle and it's all got to fit together just perfectly from my completely non-business business or logistics and supply chain <laughs> mind which we might have some students on our call here who really are new to even considering uh, this type of work or even the area of business uh, as most of you came through so thank you that's helpful uh, Dr. Townsend, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I would just say kind of to differentiate between the two. So the, the supply chain management refers to everything that's involved in planning, controlling, and executing the flow of either the delivery of a, a service or a product from its conception to delivery, and that includes purchasing materials, production, manufacturing, the final distribution, whereas logistics is really just a portion of the supply chain. It's really focused more on the transportation and storage of whatever the service or product is. So mm -hmm. logistics is a component of the larger supply chain. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that uh, I would imagine some students get really excited about or could get really excited about is the global nature of this kind of work. And if anything, I think uh, the pandemic has exposed, but maybe we don't think about it that way, the, the necessity for these types of positions. And uh, we think about how we want to get that thing off of Amazon, but we don't always think about all the steps involved in it getting to us. And we've seen shortages of toilet paper and bicycles and who knows what else over the last year. And uh, these are really tangible fields that relate to all of those things that affect our daily lives. Uh, Tracy, as you said, everybody's your customer. And you've got those internal customers that want to meet their goals for production, for shipping, whatever it is, but they can't do their jobs without the materials. Uh, and when I think about the, I think of maps, when I think of jobs like what Mr. Scarper is doing and how to get things from point A to Z. And so many of our students, I think, enjoy the idea of being connected with the global society. And these products are coming and going from all over. And, and these are opportunities that exist all over. Um, so as related to that, if you could shed some light on whoever wants to jump in, uh, what are some of the industries that are most in demand and recruiting for these types of professionals? Um, with my experience, I would say what I see is manufacturing and healthcare is in high demand. That, uh, pharmaceutical is, is, is what I was gonna, gonna say that's in is in high demand, um, you know, if you, any any job boards you go look for, particularly in the area that we're in, um, I, I don't know where everyone else is located, but you know, the, the RTP area is just, you know, is, is moving and there's constant, um, you know, you just, I like to keep my finger on the pulse and, you know, see, what, see what's out there and make comparisons to, you know, jobs that I have open and, and you know, are we, you know, are we similarly aligned? And there, there's there's a there's a lot going on in pharmaceutical, and like you said, health healthcare. I've seen a lot of um, a lot more um, supply chain roles being added in um, hospitals mm -hmm. um, than than I've than I've ever seen before. I'm glad you guys said that because I think most of the time people think that um, is primarily manufacturing. And I see someone said it's related to COVID-19, but actually there there have been a lot of logistics and supply chain roles in, in healthcare for some time. So it's not specifically related uh, to that. I actually at one point worked in um, pharmaceutical logistics and it's just, there; it's very regulated. And so it requires a lot of planning to move the product. Um, if you have certain types of um, drugs that are different classes. Some of them have to be locked. Um, you know, some of them have to be refrigerated. You have to make sure that it's maintained at a certain temperature, both in storage and in transportation. Um, each different type of 
of um, medication will have its own standard operating procedure for how it should be handled. Um, so it's just, you know, it, it, it's a food grade item. So it has to be super clean. It's just, you know, it's just a very um, hands-on kind of um, thing. So in addition to what they said, manufacturing, healthcare, pharmaceutical, I would also say e-commerce is another one, which um, Jesse alluded to with like Amazon. Um, and then also you have your seasonal industry. So any type of those um, holiday pop-up shops, like when you see those Halloween stores or Christmas stores that come up, those are other kind of um, things that use a lot of those professionals. So that I think a lot of people don't tend to think about. Yeah, I was, I was gonna go there. Um, you know, I think we're seeing a lot of um, what they call, uh, I think I just lost the word in my head, but um, basically anything that sells a product is gonna require a supply chain department, a supply chain employee. You know, you're gonna have to purchase the inventory. You're gonna have to uh, manage inventories. You're gonna have to sell it. You're gonna have to transport it. Um, the word that I was looking is virtual. So, you know, they're coming up with so many virtual companies, which means it's a company that purchases a product and then resells it, you know, at a different price or to a different type of market, different customer. And, you know, even though it's not your typical supply chain, they don't have manufacturing, they don't have quality. I mean, they still have to have that supply chain department where they're, you know, bringing the product into a warehouse, they're storing it, they're managing the inventory, the inventory costs, they're, sending it to the other customer. So, um, you know, honestly, nowadays, anything that, that sells a product uh, is gonna have a supply chain department. Right. When I worked at Revlon, we did a lot of what you're talking about, third party um, contracting. So, you mm -hmm. know, we, we brought it in, it's already, it's already a finished, it's already a finished material, um, but you have to handle it just like any other, you know, you have to purchase it just just like you purchase, you know, a, a makeup cap. <laughs> you're you're it's, you're just purchasing a, a finished good, like you said. You may put a different label on it or or do something different to it. But um, but I've seen a lot more of that in the last several years of, of my career than than I had before. And like you said, I, I think it's growing more virtually um, now as well. Yeah, I like to add, add on to that as well. Um, I see that every day in my career. And one of the biggest challenges that I see with that is they always ask me, Sheldon, you know, how do I compete with the Amazons? How do I compete with the Walmart um, platforms? And what happens is they have to understand their price point and profitability points are not the same. So we start to mapping stuff out. As Jesse was saying earlier, we literally have a supply chain map and we map out the whole supply chain. And some of the things that I look for is how much of the merchandise is sold before it comes, say, to the U.S. is coming, if it comes international? And what we try to do is eliminate cross stocking and warehousing. So we know that if 40% of it is sold, uh, we actually have a facility where we bring the sold merchandise in, and then based on the manifest, we are distributed to the end user, then take the other 60% to the warehouse. Overall, reducing the customer total spend, making it more profitable. Now they don't have to have a bigger warehouse and it just get deeper and deeper at some things we do to, to make some of the smaller customers profitable and to compete with the Amazons of the world. That's, that's a good point. That's a good, yeah, I hadn't really thought about it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. And Melanie, I wouldn't have thought about the pop-up shops, but I've had that thought casually when I see those Halloween towns or whatever they are. I think, what do they do in the off season? That stuff's got to go somewhere. The right. store's not empty at the end of the season. So you've got to move that stuff and store it. And um, I don't know if that involves cost docking. Sheldon will have to explain that for us in a little bit. <laughs> in fact, let's stop there. There's a couple of terms I already heard so far. And this is not Dr. Townsend's class where you'll get a good debrief of all of this, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> but I've heard a few key words that other people might be worrying about uh, or wondering about. So SAP cost docking, I think I had a note on another one that was mentioned, uh, just in time. Tell us what these things mean in layman's terms. Well, cross, well, cross docking, all right, you bring a merchandise to another dock, really, that's what it is. Um, why do that if you, have to, if you can eliminate that? Every time you store merchandise, it costs. 
And my job as a account executive for some of the big companies that we buy from every day is to make them profitable and give them a competitive edge. If I can remove one cross stock, I can effectively help you get your merchandise to your consumer one to two days earlier. If I'm get, helping you get your merchandise to your consumer one or two days earlier, a lot of times it means you get to collect your monies earlier. So eliminate storing it at any cross dock or a dock it has to stay at for any time. Take it just directly to the consumer. That's if that's viable in your situation. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, so kind of like the simplest thing is a cross dock, you don't store things there. It goes from one, basically it's a dock where um, product would arrive on one truck and then be removed from that truck and directly placed on to either staged on the dock itself to wait on another truck and then placed on another truck to be consolidated with other products and moved to its next destination. So that's a cross dock versus where hardware would be stored. So stuff at a cross dock normally would just sit there for no more than 24 hours before it's moved on to another vehicle to make it to its next destination. At the Sheldon's point, if you can skip that term, that turn in the transfer tank, then you'll save some money. So, you know, if you're able to eliminate those things and make it go direct, um, then it would be cheaper in movement. But that is a term that a lot of people um, don't know, even in operations, Jesse. So that's not, I, my husband, a, a director of, of machining. And when I worked at um, X Freight, which is a cross dock, like exclusively, it's just cross dock. Mm -hmm. Um, he could not understand the concept that we didn't store anything. Like every time I would tell him, he was like, well, where does it, where's it stored? I was like, we don't store anything. He just could not un understand it. We don't, there are no racks. There's no, like, it's just, it sits on the floor for a minute and it moves on to another truck. So that's cross docking. Another one of the terms you said, SAP, that's uh, just a, a software program that's used to manage supply chains. I don't remember what the third term you said was. Just, just in time. Okay. Um, just in time is just um, basically saying that we're not going to make a bunch of inventory that's going to sit around and wait to be demand. We're doing it kind of, you know, as, as demand comes, we do it just in time to meet that demand. So we're not making a bunch of product for it to sit up and just be shelved. That's the simplest way to define it to people that don't really have any experience. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's the fresh bakeries instead of the items that you find on the shelf in the, uh, <laughs> and well, the, the I mean, you're saying store. bakeries, but it could be like when she was talking about automotive, we're talking about engines, right? So instead of uh, storing a bunch of engines, we're going to make the engine as it's ordered um, so that we're not wasting a bunch of money and space storing a bunch of stuff that's not in demand right now. Oh, and sure. also it's, believed uh, the philosophy if you make it that way then you're kind of forced to adhere to higher quality because you have you know the lesser buffer of we have all this stuff you know ready to go it has to be right so it can go just in time right right yeah yeah I was trying to boil it down to layman's I'm thinking of a bakery we all know what that's <laughs> like right the hot not yeah. hot nail sign is on versus I'm right. going to food line and get the the donuts on the shelf yeah, but there is and, a and the automotive too. <laughs> and, and the automotive world um, for just in time, it, it, you know, and, and it depends which car company you're you're working with. But their, you know, their ultimate goal is that when when it when they order it from you and it comes off the truck within hours, it's on their lot. Right. Um, and um, like you said, there you run with very little stock, um, and 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 we we in my prior life um supplied tier one to all the you know the big three plus toyota um and uh, and some of the other asia pacific and um they're they're very heavy fines if you um if you shut a plant down if you don't get if if it's just in time and the truck shows up uh, a lot of uh sheldon you'll be familiar with this a lot of toyota was milk run so they they you know would come and consolidate the, the milk run, you know, so you have a little bit of everybody's product and then they go and they either drop it at a, at a you know, cross stock and then it goes to the different facilities. And if you miss that truck, um, you've got a very small window of time to expedite it yourself to get it right. to the plant. Because if it gets to the plant too late, that it, it's not going to 
to to be able to be put on the car that it's just you know supposed to go on everything from that point on the line on the automotive line stops from that point back and you as the supplier have to pay for that and some of the fines for that i've seen fines anywhere from twenty five thousand to fifty thousand dollars per minute of downtime because you have to pay at that point you shut them down you have to pay for every operating expense because they're union they're going to pay their workers they're going to pay their you know they they they, they there there's a calculation you know for for the lights that have to stay on there's there's a calculation for everything so really hardcore just in time is um is it's it's got to be there and if if it's not um, we we air we air freighted a lot. It it, it was uh, if you had a component shortage and an issue, it, it was better to spend to charter an airplane for fifty thousand dollars to get to the plant on time than to shut a plant down. And um, and that was a, a that was a concept that was hard to um, kind of hard to get used to. I, I don't know um, you know if anyone in, in this group has been in automotive or any of those types of environments, but just for the students, if you ever are, um, it's 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 pretty it's pretty serious, pretty serious business, and it keeps the inventory low. It keeps a uh, little inventory in in the pipeline. Um, I visited the plant that made the Toyota Tundra, and they did not even have a ERP or MRP system. Everything was done on Kanban and um, supermarket slash buffer type systems. So they knew what they needed to order by visual management. And if there was a hole, you know, there was a hole in the space it was supposed to be when they went to get it, that that's a problem. So mm -hmm. just a little, just a little expansion there. And because I have a because I have a, I have some, I have some horror, I have some horror stories and long nights of air freights coming in, waiting for, uh, for for airplanes to land at, at Raleigh and, get, and be waiting there to help get customs clearance, etc. Um, but not all, oh, you know, JID is that serious. Right, right. But Trace, I would like I guess that's Tracy, you're right. We like to add, I've been on the other end as well, where a customer get fined twenty and fifty thousand dollars. And students, I can tell you, it's very stressful when you have to manage having an airplane chartered, making sure it gets there on time, making sure it gets to the customer. I mean, that's when you at your finest, and Tracy can tell you probably more about it than I can, but I've seen in the poultry industry as well. It's it's real business. It is. Like I said, I, I'm not exaggerating when I, I, I have been with our freight broker at the airport at Raleigh waiting for an airplane to come in so we can could make sure to, uh, to, to get everything customs cleared. And then, of course, I was there to be able to get the communication for when it's coming to the plant, what to expect, and then to get the communication to the customer so they know because they're, they're very involved in your process. When you get to that point with them, they're 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 helping you manage <laughs> they're helping you manage your your facility and you it that that's not a lot of fun either but it it's the nature of the business um you know kind of the the, the running joke was you know and i've only had a couple of things that were you know to, to that degree but um one of the times that i did that we had an employee appreciation dinner and um, I forget what for, but I ate dinner on all three shifts <laughs> because I was because I was at the plant for for all three shifts. Um, because when you're talking about that kind of money, you're you know you're you're going to be available to do everything that you can to to not cost your company that money. It doesn't take very many of those types of things to uh, to run you out of business, and you don't That's, want your name attached to it. Right. Right. That's a great segue uh, to another question I'm sure that is on students' minds while I encourage them not to use salary potential uh, as their driving force between uh, choosing career paths, especially with all that you just shared. There's a lot involved, a lot on the line for businesses, and uh, hopefully they're investing well in the supply chain management and logistics professionals who are keeping the, these horror stories from happening, right? So. Uh, if you could share about uh, the kinds of jobs and salaries, maybe starting what could be reasonable for someone with a bachelor's degree 
uh, in a field like this, or some of our seniors that are on the call that might be have a bachelor's of business but still looking to go into this field. Uh, so what are some reasonable starting salaries? I know that can vary geographically, so if we can kind of talk about maybe the Rocky Mount area, Raleigh area, and then if you want to provide information on other areas too, and then maybe long-term uh, salaries as well with experience. Yeah, that's, uh, I guess, a little tricky question, right? It really depends on, on the company, the industry, the size of the company that you work mm -hmm. for. You know, I, I work for a pharmaceutical company, which, you know, historically has a, a really good salary, really good benefits. But of course, we're way smaller than Pfizer, which is across from the street from Wesleyan. So uh, most likely Pfizer salaries will be higher than, than what we are experiencing in our company. Um, so it's, you know, it's a, it's a tough question to answer. Um, you know, a lot of the things that that you see when you're trying to go into, into a big company or going into pharma, they're gonna want to see experience um, before anything, just because there's so much on the line. Uh, I'm sure with the automotive or, or some of these big companies, um, there's so much on the line that that's the first thing they see. Um, you know, however, I guess entry level salary, I guess could range around the 50,000s um, a year, probably. Uh, but again, it's, you know, Michelle and Tracy, please jump in. But I, I think it really depends on industry and, and size of the company. Yeah. We had a, uh, when I worked at Rogue One, we had a, you know, a, a program with NC State because you know, they already have the supply chain management program. So we, we had a, had a program where we worked with them and, and, and that was, you know, coming in as a planner or a buyer an entry level um, was about 55 to 60,000. Um, that, that, and now that that's, it's been a couple of years since I've been there. Um, and, and that, you know, kind of depended on, you know, it, on if you had any, you know, some people might have been already had their degree and been somewhere for a year and, you know, and came in, they would get, you know, a little bit more, but because they had that supply chain degree, um, I think that helps the, um, that, that, that helps bridge not having the experience yet. So, um, you know, it's, you're not, no one's going to walk out of college making bank, <laughs> but, um, but I think it's a fair, I think it's a fair entry level um, salary. And, and from what I have seen in my career now, now I'll age myself because I may be the oldest person on here. I'm not sure, but um, I've been in supply chain for 25 years. I just, I just tell everyone I started when I was 10, but, <laughs> but I'll age myself when I was, you know, 24 years old and started in supply chain and I went from temporary to permanent. My salary was $23,780 a year. And I thought I had arrived, <laughs> um, but that's been 25 years ago. Um, but, but what I found is uh, very quickly um, I was able to, to increase my salary, and of course, no one, no one out here is going to start at twenty three thousand dollars a year. But you have to think that was nineteen ninety five, ninety six. Um, but very quickly, you know, if you if you hit the hit the floor running and you pick up the 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 understanding and the concepts really quick, I found myself moving very quickly up the um, up the salary scale. Um, and, and I've seen that with, um, you know, I've seen that with a lot, a lot of the people that, that I work with, because it, it's very, to me, it's, it's very easy. Once you, once you, once you learn one part of it, you learn the next part of it. And then as soon as you have that kind of end to end understanding scope, um, the business sees that as, as a real asset and, um, it, and in my experience have been rewarded for that. So. I don't think it's a slow moving, I don't think it's a slow, or at least in my experience, I haven't seen it as a slow moving progression in salary. Um, you're not gonna go to $100,000 in a year, <laughs> don't get me wrong. But, um, but I think there's a lot of potential there um, given what you put into it and which part you're in to, to move fairly um, quickly um, up the ladder. And I, I agree. I guess it depends on the company and industry you're in. 
with a company I worked for that been a Fortune 50 company. Um, starting salary usually around 70,000, but it's a lot of responsibility. Um, within the first two years, you're making six figures. But I'm going to tell you, you're earning every bit of it. Yeah. As Tracy, yeah. you're just talking about working late nights. I can only tell you some things I've had to do while I was on this job, um, trying to make up um, graduation for my daughters and stuff like that. But I don't, yes. want, you, I don't I, want you to just think it's, oh, roses, it's not. It, it's not. I, I have been on ball fields, on telephone conferences, <laughs> and, uh, and and expediting and, you know, in and, and, and the grocery store on the phone. And uh, one of the jokes here is making a, a pot of pasta and, you know, holding the, the old phone before you had a... Uh, before you had cell phones holding it and trying to cook at the same time for my kids and the and the phone ended up in the in the boiling pasta because it, it can it can get that intense and then automotive um like you said the the salary that i gave would be where a revlon uh, cosmetics is you know it's a it is fda regulated but it is a it is a much uh, slower paced business whereas um GKN, I still have contacts and stuff there. You, you are more, you know, you, you could start, you could start 15 to $20,000 higher, but you're kind of expected to be 24 um, seven mm-hmm. as, as kind of you, you pointed out, I've expedited in the middle of the night. It's not all like that. You know, you go through periods where it's, you know, everything is smooth and running great, but, but when, but, but when it hits the fan, it, it's, it's do whatever you need to do whenever you need to do it at that at that moment and um and and my I was a single mom so my kids kind of grew up in 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 that environment and um uh, and it was you know it was normal it was normal to them if we get a call on the car they're like okay shh, we can't fight <laughs> we can't we can't argue now we can kill each other later but um luckily they were they were they were very um well they never really knew any different so they were very understanding but but you do, there, there are some sacrifices you have to make, but if you, if you do make those sacrifices, I think you, um, that helps you rise faster as well too, because like you said, you're going to work for it. You're going to, you're going to work, you're going to work for that money. But when they see that you're going to work for that money, um, I think the people that you work for, they, they, they've been there too. And they know, they know what it takes. And that's why I use the term salary potential. So you all uh, spoke well to what I say to students when they sometimes look up on ONET or Occupational Outlook Handbook and these resources that are great. Uh, and basing your decisions on what you see there is really a poor choice because you don't earn that salary unless you really earn it, as you've all pointed out. And I think, Tracy, mm-hmm. you even unfortunately said it's a good way. If you're not earning it, uh, you might not be there long. So this is a field that right. if you're really you know, wanting to succeed, you have to be committed and, and ready to put in and make those sacrifices. So thank you all for Just sharing. to, um, you know, since, since Shell and Tracy brought it up, I mean, I have a call tonight at 10 p.m. with our partners in India. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, especially when you're, when you have a global supply chain, you have to adjust, yes. you know, calls with China, calls with India, calls with New Zealand. So, yep, all hours of the night. Yes. <laughs> Yes, you do, and you 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 work around their 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 schedules, and you know you. you I, I've had a lot of uh, you know a lot of early morning, just depending on the country, and you know, that that that's kind of one of your your best case scenarios. Okay, maybe five or six o'clock in the morning, but like I said, other countries you're you're in a different. Um, you know, I've been on the phone at nine and ten o'clock at night as well, and. Um, yeah, it's it is part of it. Like I said, you do you do earn it. There is there is great um, salary potential, but um, but you earn it. But if it, if what I will say is that if it is something that you love, to me I love it. I mean it's it 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 it, it found me. Um, I didn't find it. It found me. But it was my niche. It was what I was good at. Um, and I worked um you know really hard to continue to learn and to continue to move so it was it was worth it to me um because it because it i'm because i became very passionate about it and if you like what you do those late nights and the different things that you they just kind of become part of who you are they become part of or what what you do 
uh, and um, you, you have to, you just have to be willing to put forth that effort. I feel like I must have scripted better. you all. These are the things I say to students. If you base your choices on what you're passionate and interested about, then you can more likely put in that extra time. It doesn't feel mm -hmm. like extra work. Now, maybe not always, <laughs> but more often than not, uh, there's no what I call Cinderella glass slipper, perfect fit. You love every moment of your job, even if you really like your job. There's going to be things that are not ideal. Uh, so you've painted a good picture, I think, for us uh, to grasp kind of some of the, the schedule situation and some of the global nature of this work, as Ricky mentioned, can drive that as well. So it's not all just based on having to work around the clock for demand. That's a piece of it. But also the, the global nature of the work can cause you to have to uh, be available for different time zone situations for meetings and things. Um, other aspects of the work environment and the the day to day, if you can kind of explain what this looks like, um, can, we're not there touring your facilities with you, right? But I wonder if some of our students, as we've talked about the manufacturing components of it, and we're thinking about drugs, and I'm picturing being gowned in, in an environment where you know very clean standards are being held, and there's a line, and there's packaging, and boxes, and trucks, and uh, what are the people in your jobs? What does their environment look like? Is that what it looks like? Are you at a desk? Tell us about that. Help us touch and feel it. Well, my environment is my car. That's my office. <laughs> <laughs> you won't want to see it, but uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, every day um, I have two cell phones, basically, um, audio going through the car. And I try to make about three, four visits a day. I have a very large area. And my goal is to meet customers that need my help or I can help them with a problem and continue to sustain the business that I have. And usually in my line of work, I have customers that need to move product in a nationally, globally to the U.S. in a most efficient way and then to the end user. And it's just a lot of moving parts in that, cost involved. And you just got to be very strategic every day. I'm planning, holding Zoom calls or in front of customers with meetings, positioning my company and services, how to help them do that best. And then uh, most people who know me would say, they get tired of me saying, I want a uh, number seven at the McDonald's. So <laughs> you're, <laughs> that's, that's my lunch. <laughs> Kind kind of same but different. Uh, you know, my my environment is you know is an office, but you know my 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 daily routine is you know you can check the email, see you know see what's on fire, or what's not on fire, see what needs to be handled immediately, and then I'm constantly up and on the production floor, stopping at the lines to to discuss you know what how how the the previous day, night went, what do I need to know? Are you, you know, are you out of anything? Are you running into any quality issues with your, with your products? Um, trying to um, try, I, I try to keep a, to me, it's a, it's a real collaboration with production because if, if you don't collaborate with production, um, they're not going to help you. <laughs> and there, there are times they have, they have to help you because things change and customers change requirements, which mean unplanned changeovers. And, you know, which of course uh, affects their, uh, you know, their downtime. And, um, and if, and if, and if you're not there, if, if you're not there with them understanding all of that, then they're, they're not going to be there for you. But, um, you have to really keep your pulse on what's going on. Um, if, if you're on the, you know, the supply and production side of it, and then my next round is um, is through the the quality area to see if anything was rejected in the, in the previous in the previous day, and then my next area is the um, the logistic group, and you know, kind of the same same thing. Um, finger on the pulse. What's what's going on? Do you have any issues? Anything that's major? going on because of course there's there's people that are handling that but I want to know you know because you being being blindsided by something um is is not good you know as the supply manager even as the planner even as the buyer um your your manager should never know know of a problem before you know there's a problem you should be the person telling them that there's a problem and um so that's kind of my environment I make you know I make the rounds 
and then, um, you know, come back into to my office and take care of, um, you know, there's multiple di different things, you know, different days you're doing different things. Some days you're you're working on a master schedule and you're, you know, you're 90 day, 60 day, I'm sorry, 90 day, 120 day, 180 day plan. Sometimes you are um, working on your, you know, your inventory, um, inventory levels. That, that's that's a, a big thing. Your in inventory turns, how much inventory you have, um, as opposed to um, what your inventory targets are, what what you're gonna what you're gonna do about it, which which makes another you know complete circle back through logistics and to an inventory control of you know this change from this to this last month to this month, um, you know, why is it, you know, did, is it, a, is, do we need a cycle count? Is there a problem? Is there a loss or did, did we just pull ahead? So it, it's something different every day, but I think, like I said, you, you start, you start in the office, but I don't, I don't stay in the office. Um, I think you have to be, you know, you, you have to be collaborative with, with production, with the, with with your logistics manager, with your procurement um, buyers, and you know you you have to know what's going on. Um, some places that I've been is it, not office. A lot of places are going to uh, the very the the when I worked in automotive, everyone sat in cubicles, and they were they were four people cubicles. So you didn't even have a partition between you there. If it was a large cubicle, but there were four of you in there and you were in there with your teams, you had your planner, you had your, um, your ME and you had your QE. And, um, and then you, sometimes there was your, you know, electrical engineer as well. So you were kind of placed by business unit um, to work together. Even the plant manager sat in, in, in the, um, in the, you know, in the cube area. Um, at Revlon, when I started there, everyone was in cubes, unless you were director level or above. And, um, but they were partitioned cubes where you were, you know, by yourself, you know, but you had somebody five seconds, you know, <laughs> that could hear you real close. So there, there's different, different environments and um, the, the, the one that I think I liked the least was the was the open environment because it's it's very hard for people like me who are not quiet people um, <laughs> to um, to have conversations and you know you, you have to be mindful of, of, of who's around you. So I, I've been in about every kind of environment you are, but I think your your daily routine is kind of the same. You you come in, you check it out, and and you. You go out and you physically, you know, determine what's going on. Um, that that's my take on it. That may not be everyone else's management style, but um, but that's mine. Um, I guess with me, it's a little bit different um, than Tracy. Tracy seems to be more on the manufacturing side. Uh, so when I first started, I uh, did start our, our manufacturing side, which is located in Greenville, North Carolina. But as our supply chain grew, we sort of switched our supply chain more to, to our corporate office. Uh, so now we're sitting in the Raleigh area. And this is because we have a lot of our contract manufacturers, which is, you know, other manufacturers who make our products for us. Uh, because, you know, we don't have the equipment or the capabilities to make these products. We have over 150 prescription drugs that we're currently selling. Uh, some are, you know, in the form of cream or pills or capsules. Uh, some maybe a foam or um, like a transdermal patch, which is, you know, I guess to put an example, you know, like the nicotine, nicotine patches that you put on your skin, but with actual uh, pain medication or muscle relaxer or whatever it may be the situation which requires um, very technical equipment. So uh, there are a lot of products that we don't have the capabilities of doing. So we hire other manufacturing sites who make those products for us. So um, the planning that I'm managing is for finished goods. So I work a lot with our commercial and sales team um, with their forecasting of sales. They, they have to forecast sales six and eight months in advance for us. 
so then we go and forecast our um, supply plan where we tell all these manufacturers, uh, including our own, of course, in Greenville and Australia, uh, what they're going to make for us, depending on the inventory that we're going to have when we are, you know, six and eight months from now. Um, so most of my interactions, they, they shifted from the manufacturing side to more the commercial side. Um, which is similar to that conversation that I was having earlier with the virtual companies. You know, you don't have to really be inside of a manufacturing side today to, to run a supply chain. Um, and, you know, we're, we're not a virtual company by any means. We control all the raw materials that go into the, the third party manufacturers who make our products. Uh, we control the quality control piece of it. We just don't physically make it. Um, but yeah, on the day to day, you know, we're we're in an office setting. Uh, definitely a lot of meetings with with the different sales departments. We have different sales divisions: dermatology, women's health, generic products, uh, control substances, and you know, we're meeting with them on a daily basis. They're talking about their forecast, their sales team, what's happening out there, Walgreens, CVS, uh, you know, any changes to the environment. Uh, given that it's pharmaceuticals, you know, there is a lot of laws that, that uh, influence the pharmaceutical environment. So um, a lot of changes. I mean, it's the way, um, you know, supply chain was described to me by my boss when I first started is, you know, it's, it's like when you go to a restaurant, right? You, you order a burger and the burger shows up to your table 10 minutes later. And, you know, you don't know what happened on the back end. Somebody had to kill a cow, get the meat send the pack the meat send it over to the restaurant get the cheese send it over to the restaurant somebody had to cook it somebody had to come take your order somebody had to bring it to you i mean it's so many processes so many moving pieces right so um it's a it's a very dynamic environment forever changing um and i guess supply chain is what needs to keep the balance amongst everything you know when you're working with the manufacturing sites, uh, manufacturing sites, they they look at efficiency. How can they make as much product for as little as possible, as quick as possible? But you know, when you when you look at the inventory side of, of things, is well, I don't need as much product as I can make because having product sitting in the shelves is costing me money. So you try, you need to keep that balance uh, amongst all things. So. Um, interactions with almost every department that there is in the company um, from finance, commercial, quality, the different manufacturing sites. Uh, so very dynamic uh, environment and, you know, definitely requires a lot of planning and a lot of strategy like Sheldon was saying earlier, earlier on the call. Great, great. Well, I've taken down a long list of skills here that I'm hearing. Some you all said directly, uh, some that I'm inferring. Um, but please add to my list, panelists, if there's anything else, any particular skills that our students would need to have an interest in developing if they don't already have. I'm, I'm hearing a lot about teamwork, collaboration, constant communication. I'm not picturing these. Maybe once in a while when you're working on some of those plans that you've mentioned, there might be some working independently uh, focused time, but it sounds like mostly you're, you're constantly in contact with other people, having to keep your relationships strong. Uh, so great people skills, uh, that attention to detail, following through that reliability, uh, making sure that you come through with what you've promised. Relationships, again, <laughs> I've noted that a couple of times. Planning, uh, being flexible, problem solving, analysis, any other big skills that students would need to make note of? Just the um, uh, ability to 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 change, uh, and not, if you're not a person that likes change, then it's then it, it it may be something you need to 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 work on because you you can go in and you know I always had pretty significant drives to work, so that's when I would do my kind of you know plan for the day and. Sometimes I would be met at the front door with, oh my gosh, we're out of this product. What are we going to do? Come help us, you know, come help us redo the plan and determine what we're going to do. And then my whole day is, you know, is out the window. But of course, those are things that I still need to do um, 
but I can't say, okay, I'll get with you in just a minute because I already had a plan for today and this was not in it. So um, I think you have to have that ability to kind of be a chameleon. You can change from one thing to the other and, and, and back to it along with multitasking. Um, but, but being okay with, um, and, and I'll be honest with you, that was one thing that was hard for me early in, in my career because, um, I was not a, a change person. I'm now, I, you know, it just, you know, I can go hour to hour, but, but that, that was a little bit difficult for, for me to work on. And I had to do that because it's, you can't say, you just can't say that to your, to, to, to a crisis or whatever. I, no, I already, I already, I already know what I'm going to work on right now. And to me, this is important. Um, so you just have to have that build that flexibility. Um, I think is very important. You no, know, say, you know, communication is, is going to be key. Um, you know, being in supply chain, no matter if it's an entry level or the highest senior leadership there is, um, you will be talking to the senior leadership of your company presenting, um, you know, Tracy alluded earlier to the SNLP process, sales operations and planning, you know, we're, we're meeting um, on a monthly basis and we're sitting in front of our CEO where we're talking about any kinds of issues that we're seeing with our manufacturing sites. We're bringing updates on inventory, we're bringing updates on sales um, or on new product that we're launching, et cetera. And, um, you know, I started joining this process uh, when I started as a planner. So as a very entry level, I was sitting in the same table as our CEO. And, you know, I was put on the spot. I was asked questions. Uh, so the, the ability to communicate, uh, that's going to be key being in supply chain because you're going to be interacting with almost every department in the company in some way, shape or form. Yes. And Ricky, oh, it sounds don't be like communicating to, yeah. under pressure, you know, high pressure mm -hmm. environment. And, yes. and uh, we've got some questions. I think uh, David asked a good one related to that. We're going to get to in just a little bit. But uh, yeah, it sounds intense. So related to these skills, it was mentioned somewhere along the way about experience. I think, Tracy, you might have alluded to um, how the degree can uh, supplement a lack of experience. One of the questions that students had asked when registering uh, was related to, uh, I guess this person has been looking at positions because they referenced that they've seen this number of five years experience being mentioned several times now um, so please correct any advice i give to students generally what i tell students when it comes to seeing experience listed on job announcements is that unless it specifies anything you've done while you're breathing is experience so unless it says full-time work experience then you can certainly make an argument for your related experiences which includes academics but Anything you can share related to going in as an applicant with that required number of years of experience and those kinds of approaches and how the degree in academics can supplement that or not? Um, I think you can, um, you, first of all, I think that the degree, like I said, with, with you know, Revlon luckily had the, had the you know, had that, that program interaction. So it was kind of understood um, one thing that helps, um, and I don't have it myself, um, but I will tell you that APIC certification um, is uh, a big plus for um, for not having the 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 work experience. Um, the the APIC certification kind of gives you a lot of that, uh, and, and and I don't know if that's part of the program. I know some places that's part of the program. You become APIC certified. It's, it's you, you take classes just like you do um, college classes that that is um, that's definitely a help that definitely gives you a, an edge over the experience. Um, another thing that NC State did is they um, they a lot of their students already knew SAP um, before they came in the door. They it, it was a more of a base model. There, there are many different um, some are just out of the box. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, configuration changes to match the business when their SAP launches. But I know that um, that was another you know that was another thing we we looked at. Of course, it, it, when all of this started, we were also getting ready to launch SAP, so that that was a help. But that kind of gives you some systems knowledge that um that you 
you know, e even if you don't have it offered at the college, there are programs outside that you, you can take. So that gives you some MRP experience um, that you can use as experience on your resume. Okay, no, I haven't done it in a working environment, but I do know how I do know how to 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 use MR, the MRP tool um, because you'd be surprised how many people that I have interviewed um, and asked them to walk me through their planning process that never mentioned the word MRP. And when I said MRP, they were, um, what is MRP? by <laughs> you're you know out out the door because if you if you're you, that's you know that that's just uh, i assume everyone who is on here is familiar and knows what i'm talking about uh we're not know, what is mrp uh, tracy i'm not <laughs> yeah you know, so materials requirements planning so it's part usually part of a bigger erp system but your mrp is what is what basically um tells you what to buy what to build what you know you it, you start, you know, just a very simplistic terms. Um, it starts as a forecast. You make your plan from the forecast. That forecast flows all the way down through the material requirements, the bill of materials. So it goes through the, the finished good all the way down to the very lowest last uh, component or raw material so that the business knows um, what what the plan is. So if you're you're looking at your uh, master schedule or your, your, your ta yeah, as uh, Ricky talked about your SNOP plan, you, you've you got to know not just what your plans are for what you're going to sell, but what are your plans for, how do you know what you're going to buy? You know, how do you know week to week what you're going to schedule? And um, and I've, I've not ever worked at a, at a company until the company I, I went to most recently had never used an MRP system, but they were implementing SAP, which a lot of people are doing right now. And that it doesn't take all the work out of it. You know, if it did, you wouldn't need people like us, but to be able to analyze and, it, and it's simple math. I have this much on hand. This is what I need. This is what the state, well, I want the safety stock to be. And this is how much I'm shipping. And, you know, it's just a formula of, okay, so it means this is what you need to produce um, in very simple layman's terms. Um, but it is a, you know, it is a big, um, it, it is the, it is, to me, it's, it's the Bible of planning and, and purchasing. How do you know what you're going to purchase? You, you, you have to have some way to know what you're going to purchase. And that's the, the MRP is going to, is going to guide you to do that. So having any type of MRP experience um, is definitely a plus because it's something you don't have to learn. Systems are different. The basics are the same. The understanding is the same. So that was one thing that a lot of our students um, that came in from NC State, I don't know if they did that through state or if it was it's something they did, you know, outside, but a lot of the students came in with the basic SAP knowledge. So one opportunity that we have through our program, fortunately, that we have grant funding through the Golden Leaf Foundation, Dr. Townsend assisted with that grant, and we have uh, grant funds available to pay students to get some experience within these industries while they're students at Wesley and to gain some of those experiences. Uh, so this is, you know, a really good aspect of the major at Wesleyan. Uh, if we have partners in the community willing to provide that experience, but maybe they didn't budget for an intern, we're able to offset that. So this is the only major at Wesleyan where we have that supplement available to make sure students can get experience. So that's one that's big awesome. plus to know about. Yeah. And Dr. Townsend, if you would comment on, uh, I know that Tracy just mentioned, and I put in the chat there a link to what I believe the certification, the APEX that you were referencing. Um, Dr. Townsend, if you want to comment on any pieces of that that relate to our program or otherwise. Um, I mean, I echo everything that um, Tracy said. Um, I think as far as I know, the initial question was about the experience level. Um, I think the internship is very important, um, but some ways that you can do that if you're not lucky enough to have the opportunity to get an internship is that you can volunteer and do some of that kind of work um, for different organizations in the community. Um, that's always uh, a plus, uh, but I do think that this is one of those fields where, because um, you have to think this industry 
is a lot of the times you'll find the people we're kind of turning over at this point, but a lot of the people that that have been in a lot of the roles for a long time don't have a lot of education. They just have a lot of experience. And, you know, so they came in straight out of high school. And so they have a lot of reverence for experience. So you're going to have to have experience in addition to your education. Your education will put you above someone else who has full experience, but you have to have the experience in this field. Uh, so some of our questions in the chat here, I wanted to throw out. Um, thank you, David, for answering one of the questions I think Nacho had asked, and he is back. Okay, yeah, I thought he had left and had returned. Um, salary, another question came up about. Uh, um, I wanted level. to address that, Jason. Oh, sure, sure, what, go what ahead. Because um, what we said when we were talking about that 50 to 65 was entry level, and the question um, that he asked was about a supply chain manager, and a supply chain manager is not entry level. Um, so that would be a higher salary um, than 50 to 65. But again, it would be largely dependent upon the size of the company, um, you know, the size of the operation at that specific uh, facility even. Um, but a manager role would be more towards, I would say median would be about 80,000. Thank you so much for catching that. Yes. And another and, question. And I think it depends on your years of experience and mm -hmm. your, um, you know, and the, and the type of company you're, you're working in because, um, you know, I see, um, in the low one hundreds to one twenty, Um, but that's, you know, that that's 25 years of experience too. So, where what you talked about being around 80 that would and be like, you know very very right on spot with with less experience than that but you're going to continue to grow mm -hmm. you know, from that point right a question came in related to entry-level positions i think they're asking for uh jesus if you want to clarify feel free to do so but i believe you're asking for titles uh, potential titles to be looking for i think i heard ricky mention his earlier position was planner um, what are some other titles that students could be looking for for that entry level? Um, supply chain analyst. Um, that's something I, I see a lot. I have a supply chain analyst. Um, um, I, of course, buyers, you know, um, and material planners. You have production planners and material planners. So um, some places are structured, and, and I've seen it both ways where you're, um, you, you have a buyer that handles everything for procurement. You know, they issue the blankets, they negotiate with the supplier, they issue the orders. Um, but I've also seen it done differently where you have a procurement agent who does the, 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 the top levels, you know, dealing with the negotiation of the prices and creating the blankets. And then you have a material planner who uses MRP to, to release all of those blankets. So material planner, production planner, um, buyer, um, supply chain analyst, um, trying to think of anything else. Uh, a, a, lot of, a, a lot of places call them now customer planners. If you're actually a production planner and you're actually um, dealing with the the, the cradle to grave type planning where you're actually the person who in, incepts the, um, you know, the orders. Um, I don't know if anybody think of anything else. Now that that's just on the planning and, you know, the su supply end. I'm sure Sheldon can give us a lot more insight on the, the different logistics. Now to me, logistics is, um, you know, is everything from the movement of material not just the trucks, but you know your, you know your your cycle counters, your inventory analyst. Um, that that's part of that's part of our warehouse and logistics group a, a, as well. Um, and of course, you know, moving the material with forklifts and things like that. But that's not really in this in this arena, but still part of moving the material. But but the um, inventory aspect of it, um, inventory analyst cycle counter, those things are, um, they're, they're, a good, they're a good place to start um, entry level positions as well. Especially if you're, if you're finding a, you know, a little bit of a difficult time, usually there's less education or less, um, less experience needed for those types of positions, but they're good to, 
they're good to get your foot in the door and start um, and, and understand it kind of from the back end forward. Did I miss anything, you guys? Of course, there's, you know, warehouse manager, logistics yeah. manager. Um, I think that's great. Like said, and we've actually received a couple of postings recently on our College Central Network platform uh, for some entry level logistics and supply chain positions. So I encourage, I'll pop the link in in just a little bit uh, to encourage students to go and look there. Of course, there's other great resources as well, but uh, at, when we receive postings, oftentimes they are for more entry level. One, for example, is titled logistics coordinator and it's looking for one to two years of experience. Mm -hmm. um, so there, I do see a lot of variety in the titles that come through and, and that can be challenging for students. And I encourage you to read into at least a skim, you know, of the job descriptions because there's not a common title for lots of fields, not just these that we're talking about tonight. The company might have their own way of referring to a role. Uh, so really taking the time to read through those and, and decide if that's a fit for what you're looking for. Yeah. And I, Jesse, I'd like to agree with that. Um, just by looking at the title does not always explain what you're going to do. <laughs> so make sure you really understand what you're applying for. I, I can tell you some of the things I do, it's not enough time on this call to explain how I'm involved in sometimes completely redoing people's warehouses warehouse optimization. Um, I'll take on complete integration of like the SAP with our shipping system. And I can tell you it was the internships <laughs> that I've done at, in the adult learning program as well with the entry level positions that helped me out a lot because if you're not prepared, you would feel a lot of pressure at first until you get the flow of everything. Right, right, yeah. Um, great. Some other titles I see we've got right now uh, came in today, two positions, administrator, dispatcher, uh, so, and those both relate on the logistics piece as well. So there's a lot of variety. Yes. Yeah. While we're talking about entry-level opportunities and experience, David asked a really great question. I think Ricky might be uh, most recently uh, familiar with this experience, no offense, Ricky, <laughs> but you described being in these meetings with the CEOs and it sounds like if you ever had imposter syndrome, maybe that's where you have it. So David's question was how you handle that. Did you ever experience imposter syndrome at the beginning of the career and how did you overcome that? So I guess, um, what do you mean by imposter syndrome where I guess you would act as if you know what you're talking about. I mean, is that what you're referring to in this particular question? David, you want to answer that for yourself? Um, no, actually, I was referring to like feeling that you are not ready, like you are in a position where you don't belong to. You are not ready for feeling in that position. You, you feel like an imposter in the room sitting with everybody else around. Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly when you first start you know uh, i came in without hardly much experience i did a couple internships that truly helped me and, and i had knowledge on some terminology used um but i can tell you my first week i started you know on a tuesday i think i went through my, my training my, my onboarding process and that friday we had one of our snop meetings and of course i was part of the supply chain team who manages that meeting. So I, I, I went in there and I'm sitting there in a, in a brand new company, only been there for four days. Um, you know, they're talking about all the moving pieces going on, issues, quality issues, inventory things going on, new products that are launching. And I've never even heard of half of these products that they, they're, they're referring to. So of course it can be a little bit uh, intimidating at first, um, you know, because if, if, if you haven't been there, right, you're coming in the middle of something. So it can be a little bit intimidating at first. Uh, but once you, you know, you jump right to it and, and start kind of studying your role, your responsibilities, your duties, get to learn and, and get to know uh, the people that you're working with, the departments that you're working with, the products that you're working with, the inventory that you're managing. I mean, it, it becomes really really part of your daily routine, you know? I mean, I've, I've, you know, definitely as soon as you're, you're entering a new job, is, I'm, I'm sure you're always gonna feel a little bit intimidated with everything going on. And especially if you haven't been there uh, from the get go to, to know about what they're truly talking about. But after you, you jump to it, if you 
you really start paying attention to detail and start studying what, what you're supposed to do and learning about the company and, and all the different processes, you will be fine. And I Thank think you. too, um, it, especially when people know that you're, um, you know, you're, you're, you're freshly into this, you're not, you know, you're not a, a 20 year season veteran. I don't think it's, um, I don't think that there are very many people who are going to down you for asking a question. You know, to me, I was just talking about MRP. To me, that's second nature. It's part of it. And then I thought, wait a minute, does everybody know what MRP is? I don't think every, anyone was dumb that because they didn't know what that was. Um, and if anybody has, hey, whoa, what are you, what are you talking about? Um, I don't think anyone is going to um, to down you for asking the question because there's no stupid question if you don't understand um, and then you know and, and if you don't want to do it in in the in the form of you know sitting in the PSYOP meeting because I've been there too early on and just kind of take some notes going you know, shake your head for a little okay you, know, you look like you're and and you can tell the people in the organization that are are your books of knowledge and who are your people who are, are ready to share that, who are ready to share that knowledge. And, uh, and you find those people pretty quickly. They, they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're usually in your face pretty early on, you know, to, to, to help you because they're passionate about it. So you, you know, you, you, you determine the things that you, you don't understand. Don't feel stupid. Don't feel dumb because we've all been there. And most everyone in there has been there for a lot longer and they had to learn to and either ask right out or, or like I said, find you someone to attach to that, you know, you feel comfortable with that you could ask those questions to. And um, I don't think um, I don't think that there are very many people who who um, who make a judgment of asking a question. It, to me, when I get the questions to me, it's like, ah, oh, that's a good question. That to me that you're thinking you're 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 going down the right track. You know that you know that you need to know and you're not quite sure. So to me, it's a positive to ask the question because you want to know, you want to understand the business, you want to understand what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's a great thing to to think about um, embracing where you are. Simon Sinek has a great number of TED talks out there, and he talks about some of these concepts. If you're not familiar with Simon Sinek, look him up. Um, but one of his talks, he references entry level situations and people know who you are at the table and you might have had a couple of internships, but you're new and you're learning. And, and in some ways, it's great for someone like David, who's interning right now with a local company who's loving him and uh, he's fitting right in. So I know it won't be a problem for you, David, but uh, to be humble and, and to not pretend like, you know, things that people at the table know that you don't know. And that's not specific to this field. It's for every field is. Uh, asking right. these questions, but respecting the process as you're sitting there, as Tracy demonstrated, you're taking your notes and uh, showing your active listening with the nod, not the I know what we're talking about. And I'm not going to interrupt and slow this process with questions at the inappropriate time, but uh, having that maturity to know when and who to take those to. Yeah, you know, that's key. I, you know, I, I, every meeting I went to that first couple of weeks, I, I wrote down my questions, right? I mean, what does uh, this mean when it comes to DEA, because we have uh, drugs that are controlled by the DEA, right? So what does this mean? I mean, how does that relate to what I do? So I will literally write down the questions in a notepad. And after I will go to my coworker and say, all right, let's sit down here. Let's talk about this. Um, if they, you know, if they hire you, they see potential in you. They don't expect you to know everything. So they rather you ask questions and learn because they saw that, that you're capable of learning. They saw that you are motivated to work hard and learn then, um, then you making a mistake that is gonna cost money to the company, cost your job, whatever. So yeah, asking questions is gonna be key. And that's not just in the very beginning. You know, if you move from one job to another, there there's different lingo for there's different language. Um, you know, the 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 first time I when I, you know, I had, had some experience with FDA with um, with cosmetics, but in the tobacco industry, it's completely different. And they're talking about you know the DEA. <laughs> they're talking about FDA, the TTB, and so like, what is what is TTB? Well, that's your you know it's a specific tax that goes you know to uh, you're you're going to have those um, those nuances at different companies too, not just in the very beginning of your of your career. So that that's um, I, I think it's expected to you know to to have to have questions 
And if you go into transportation logistics, like I did, you're dealing with multiple different types of companies and industries. And I felt it a lot, but you have to be humble and say, you know, can, can you elaborate a little more and have that friendly conversation? Um, everybody's willing to work with you just as long as, you know, you're not disrespectful and um, they work with you and you get used to it. All right, I see that we are coming up on the end time of our event and we do wanna be respectful of everyone's time involved. So I do see we still have a number of great questions. It looks like we could hang out all night talking about this field, but we are not going to do that. So I want to first say, these professionals are all on LinkedIn and I hope our students are too. If you're not, let's take care of that. Get your LinkedIn profile set up, uh, make it professional. If you don't know how to do that, let's talk. Uh, you know how to reach me and then connect with these individuals. I can't speak for them that they're willing to continue this conversation, but the fact that they're on LinkedIn says that they're open to networking. So you can certainly uh, try to connect and send direct messages for follow-up conversations. And as they're available, uh, they may be able to share more with you. Uh, but I will address one of the questions remaining in the chat, and I'm sorry that we're not going to get to all the rest of these during our live time. Uh, but one question related to another global question that we had planned to pose tonight related to your long term of the field and challenges that you might see uh, coming down the pipeline. And one of the particular questions I saw in the chat here again from David uh, referring to specifically tensions with China. But I think the broader question uh, came after that. Uh, how do you make a supply chain flexible and not entirely dependable on one supplier? Uh, so anything related to challenges and hello junior supply chain manager joining us tracy there's a sorry my, my granddaughter decided to join us i'm i'm starting her early they're learning all these skills <laughs> uh, so please if you would share the challenges that you see and anything uh, towards that question about being flexible with your supply chain um i can share really quick uh when it comes to suppliers so i mean the biggest challenge that we're facing right now of course covid19 uh, you know, we have suppliers who are overseas in different countries, um, in countries where COVID-19 is, is, is been taking a big toll. They, they haven't been able to get it under control. They don't have vaccines like in the U.S. Um, so you have suppliers where employees cannot make it to work. Uh, employees are getting sick and, and, and they're skipping work or, or are not able to go um and that is impacting their production that is impacting their capacity they cannot make product fast enough to to send it to the u.s so you can fulfill your your forecast your demand what your customers need so uh, certainly one of the biggest challenges that we're currently facing uh, one of the things that we do of course is you know safety stock safety inventory is you know holding extra amounts of inventory um to be able to supply the market for three, four, five months in case something were to happen, something were to go wrong, you have enough inventory to, to continue to fulfill the market while you either work a solution with your supplier or you find a new supplier. Yeah. Um, in our instances, when we have a product that is very, very valuable for the company, your number one product, number two product, uh, you know, you have more than one supplier who can make that product for you. You don't you don't stick to only one supplier because if that one supplier goes down, you know the company is losing millions and millions of dollars, potential shutdown. You know a lot of things can happen. So you have multiple suppliers uh, who can make that product for you. So um, risk mitigation is a big piece of supply chain. Uh, you know we have a monthly meeting with a risk mitigation team within our supply chain department that. We're looking at every single of our suppliers. We're looking at all of the products that we have, how much safety stock inventory do we have on hand? And do we want to increase or decrease the safety stock depending on what we're seeing on the commercial side? You know, how much is that product worth to us now? Is it worth more? Are we seeing more sales? Is it a product that has been used for the flu or is it a product that has been used for COVID-19 or whatever is the situation? So you have to take all these things into account is because uh, it's not only the financial piece, but also you have to think we're making, in my industry, you're making pharmaceuticals. So you're, you're doing, making products that are changing people's lives that are critical for people to survive. I mean, um, you know, we have a big product right now that is used for patients who have transplants and if they don't take that product, the transplant can be rejected from their bodies. So uh, 
it's not only valuable, but it's very critical for patients that if they do not take it, if we run out for X, Y, C, for COVID, because transportation issues, whatever it may be, you may have patients who, who can have serious, if not critical illness uh, due to not having this drug. So you have to take all those things into account and, and definitely mitigate and try to plan as much as possible. I mean, that's, that's the core of the job is planning, mitigating, strategizing that that's, you know, in my experience, that's what it is. I would, I would agree, uh, particularly with your, yeah, in the industries I've been in, um, you have a, a, a handful of products that are used across the entire facility for, you know, for like, you know, in cosmetics, you know, alcohol um, and uh, the tobacco industry, it's glycerin. So you use that on in so many products that you 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 do not have one one supplier uh you've you've got to have multiple suppliers and and um keeping good relationships with them so not just using one supplier until you have a problem and you call them the other it's you know part, part of part of what we would do is split the business so you know you're you you keep you keep keep on good terms you you keep a continued supply so that if you do have issues with one you're you're not scrambling you know to get the other one up up to speed so so i would definitely agree with with um all of you said but especially that having having multiple um suppliers for your things that are either commonly used um on many products or that are extremely critical that you, you just cannot be out of for my side of things one of the biggest challenges is capacity i mean everybody's ordering products because we stand at home because of COVID. but what very few people realize or know planes or trucks are maxed out at every transportation in the country and if you notice delayed times with the Amazon packages now or your Walmart packages, it's a reason why, because capacity is huge. And I've seen a lot of my customers who didn't want to dual source, as Tracy and Ricardo said, and they're doing it one way, where now it's, it's, it's impacting them significantly because they don't get that first flight out anymore. Right. So capacity is a big challenge in my industry. Yes. And I'm sure you have to prioritize how you how, how, how you use that capacity, you know, based on yes. the the criticality of of the customer. Cause you know, you know, for me, I you know, I really hate it when my, you know, I'm paying for Amazon Prime. Why can't I get it in two days? Well, you know, that's not nearly as important as getting someone that needs their insulin <laughs> quickly. So, you know, you have to think about it. So I'm sure for you, there's a lot of, you know, prioritizing of that capacity. And while we all think we're, we're number one, um, it, it, I think in our roles, we, we've understood that, you know, a little bit better because we, we understand kind of how that, how, how that part of the business works, but I'm sure that's, um, I'm not sure I would want that part of your, <laughs> I'm not sure I would want that part of your job to be honest how to how to de determine that priority um, but um, I'm sure that that's that you have the knowledge to to do that I I um, like I said I want my Amazon here when I want it here but you know I, after we all kind of got used to wait a minute this is a big deal you know this that this COVID is a big deal. Um, I'm, I'm not really worried about if you know my toilet paper doesn't get here because you have you have other products that people really um, cannot live cannot live without, and um, and you have to prioritize that. I'm sure. Well, we are just a couple minutes over time. I do want to give Dr. Townsend uh, a last word opportunity to share anything in particular about how to declare this major or anything related to the academic side of this and coming on board to work with Dr. Townsend uh, at Wesleyan. Thank you. Um, I just want to call attention to the fact that if you are currently a business major, this is a major that complements that major um, very well. Um, so you could double major very easily and not really extend so much of your time. Um, 
If you have questions about um, any of this, feel free to reach out to me. A lot of these questions I thought were really good and I'm open to have that dialogue with you um, just whenever you have the opportunity. So I'm really excited that so many of you are interested in the program and I hope that you'll join us soon. And Dr. Townsend, if you would share your email address in the chat, that would be great. So everyone will have that handy. Um, and I also did just add to the chat uh, the link to our session evaluation. Please give us some feedback. It's very brief. And I will be doing a drawing from everyone who attended. I know a couple people had to drop off in the last little bit. Uh, but I will go back through the attendance and do a random number generator based on uh, sorting you guys out by some numbers and someone will win the $25 Visa gift card for tonight. And thank you to Dr. Townsend's program budget for supporting that. But uh, mostly thank you to our panelists tonight, especially our junior panelists who's been so patient with uh, sharing her grandmother <laughs> as well. Uh, <laughs> but all of you, we all have busy uh, lives. Ricky has a 10 o'clock meeting to get to. So thank you for carving out a little bit to share your insights, your experiences with our students. Don't forget to uh, to put our names in the drawing. Ah, ah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we will see. <laughs> yeah, she says that it'd be hers anyway. <laughs> That's right. That's a good grandma. Yeah. Well, thank you all for your time and have a wonderful evening. You too. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you.